Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. In today's show, we're traveling to several locations to learn about fly fishing. First, we go to the mountains of Montana to fly fish for golden trout. Then we visit the Federation of Fly Fishers Conclave in West Yellowstone. After that, we travel to Awesome Lake in Labrador to join Joe Humphreys, who's going to teach us some new nymphing techniques. It's going to be a great show, so stay with us. We'll be right back. That was awesome. Let him go back to live another day. These are extremely strong fish. Hey, go. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, good fish, good fish. We talked earlier about having the optimum conditions. Here we've got a perfect example of the family Heptogeneidae. Uh, very flat music. Sweet music. This is why you need a lot of backing. On today's show, we're fly fishing one of the many mountain lakes near the town of West Yellowstone, Montana. The targeted fish is the rare golden trout. It has been called the fish from heaven. Small and beautiful, distinctive and spectacular, this typical golden trout with its vibrant colors evolved over thousands of years adapting to the high country meadows. Joining me today is good friend and avid trout fisherman Norm Bolin, along with professional wrangler and guide Terry Search. Terry's easygoing nature and absolute expertise with horses and the outdoors will make this backcountry experience a very exciting and safe trip. Hiking to these high elevations is only for the expert and not the novice. A reputable guide service is highly recommended for your full enjoyment and safety. A horseback excursion to these high alpine lakes is one of the most thrilling and memorable experiences one could have. Oh, Terry, what a gorgeous spot you've brought me to. I've never been on top of a mountain in a mountain lake. It seems to be a small lake, but I'm seeing rising fish all over. The ride was terrific. I had a lot of fun with that, and I felt absolutely safe. I was surprised. I looked at the mountain at first and I went, oh no, but I was absolutely safe. The horses are sure-footed, that's for sure. But now I'm seeing a lot of rises, and I'm really confused as to what we should start with. What do you think we should start with? Oh, well, we're gonna start out with some terrestrial patterns, uh, ants and uh, beetles, maybe. Uh, and then we might even switch over to some smaller uh, midges. We'll have to see what they're eating. Okay, yeah, well, let's give it a try. Let's, I'm excited about this. Now, it's fairly safe to, to wade around here, eh? Yeah, watch. I these can see rocks the edge. are a little bit slick, you know. But I can and see can the see edge there. You can see where the, the shelf kind of runs out mm -hmm. and then drops off. Yeah. So you're going to want to watch that. Okay, I'll get it. I out. didn't bring waders, so I'm going to kind of oh, I'm I'm gonna pick and rise. choose and find a place where I can yep. do a, have a little back cast and maybe even do a good roll cast. I got my first golden trout. Now, he took an ant pattern, a parachute ant pattern. I seen him rise once, so I put the cast right over to him, and he took it. And these are absolutely spectacular looking fish. Now, if you look at that, isn't that absolutely beautiful? Very nice little fish. I'm just gonna let him go real nicely now. Oh, I'll give him another try. Cast to the rising fish. On the golden trout, um, you know, a five weight's a, a, probably the heaviest you want to go if you've got to punch any wind at all. Um, however, you can back off to a three or a four weight rod, no problem, and, and still, uh, you know, catch fish and have a good time. And you've got these little cruisers, you know, looking around for different aquatic bugs, and, and um, you can see them coming. It's uh, wherever you've got fish working the surface and rising. You want, you want to work in towards those fish to make that cast. And, um, you know, presentation is everything and, and not uh, throwing, you know, too far past them with the line because they are very line shy. Got a nice little golden here. Golden trout are extremely beautiful. The flanks of the males are bright red and all of gold, which is even brighter at spawning time. The females are gray blue diffused with lemon yellow. The mouths and fins are a deep pumpkin color. There he goes. 
Golden trout are native to the Sierra Nevada mountain range of California, but are also found at high elevations in Montana and in some areas of Alberta. With such a limited resource, it's imperative that catch and release with barbless hooks be practiced. Extreme care should be taken when handling these fish to ensure their survival. We're casting both the rising fish and, and fish that uh, are just out along the shelf. Um, what you want to do is just get it out there. It doesn't have to be a long cast and you're waiting for that fish to take and you can actually see them coming up from the bottom. And it's a real slow take. A lot of times they'll just come up and just bump it. Um, you just want to hang in there. You don't want to set the hook too soon and make sure they take it before you you tighten up that line. All right, fish on. Oh, this one's actually going to pull some line on me. This is great. This is a wonderful fishery you got here. It's just, I'm having so much fun. The beauty is unbelievable. We got a bit of rain now, but that's okay. That's okay. I got a nice, nice little golden trout here now. And I'm told this is a, a pretty big one. Look at how red it is. This is probably one of the prettiest fish I've seen. Absolutely gorgeous. And he's, he's fighting up a storm. Look at this. Put him upside down. See how he, he just stopped as soon as I put him upside down. Now, I'll show you the fish. Oops, and away he goes. Absolutely beautiful. I love this. This is a lot of fun. I really, I'm having a good time. You want to try this, folks, when you come to Montana. Do one of these riding trips into the mountains. They got these little lakes all over, some of them with grayling in them, some of them with these little golden trout. They're just absolutely wonderful. We maximize at about eight guests, uh, four guides, that'd be 12 saddle, and then, you know, with the pack stock carrying in camp and food and everything, about 20 head of stock. For people that are looking for a backcountry fishing experience, there's nothing like the greater Yellowstone area in Yellowstone National Park. We have uh, real diverse trout species, uh, a great opportunity to in get into the backcountry, get away from people, and uh, just enjoy the solitude and the quietness. The West Yellowstone region is an incredible destination for fly fishers and anyone who loves spectacular scenery. The rugged mountains, beautiful rivers, and abundant wildlife make this area a nature lover's paradise. Excellent, Jerry, excellent. Huh? I saw him come from the bottom. Yeah, they've been just, they, they haven't been hammering it now. They're kind of sipping right now, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, I had to just let him take it down. And barbless hooks, nice and easily out, and release the fish. Excellent. That, that's, this is just some of the most exciting fishing I've had. These are not huge fish, but they're pretty tough to catch sometimes. It can be a challenge. Yeah, you gotta practice your, your casting, that's for sure. Now one thing that I found up here in the mountains, it's markedly cooler. So you need to bring a few extra clothes. I brought a rain jacket because you never know when it's gonna rain in the mountains. And the one thing you need to do is listen to your outfitter. They know what's happening and, and listen to them good. And you'll have a really enjoyable, safe ride and great fishing. It's wonderful up here. We've been hit with at least three minor storms. Every time the rain started, the feeding stopped but we just waited it out. The rain would stop, the feeding came back up. So there's a saying in Montana that if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. It held true today. Every time it rained, they stopped feeding. Every time it stopped, they feed, fed again, and we got fish. So be persistent. That's what you have to do is be persistent. While we were staying in West Yellowstone, the Federation of Fly Fishers Conclave was being held. 
This annual gathering of who's who of fly fishing offers fly tying demonstrations, casting clinics with the top casters in the country, and seminars given by the best in fly fishing. Education of our young fly fishers is a main theme in the conclave this year, along with conservation. Fly Fishing Hall of Fame and recent recipient of the prestigious Legend of Fly Fishing Award, Joan Wolf comments on the benefits of being part of the FFF. I think that, that, that my initial feeling about FFF was that when fly fishing was not as popular as it has become, FFF was the place that all of us who cared about it were able to get together and talk about it and to start talking about what we could do as an organization in the, in the world of conservation and education. And it's been a lot of years. It was started in 1965. I went to my first convention in 1967, and I've been coming ever since. And it's been wonderful to see the organization grow, and, and I know that there, there are so many committees who do so much work and make things happen. And I, I just feel, I don't, I don't feel that I do an awful lot, but I'm so pleased to see what is going on. I think any of us with, with the numbers that are in fly fishing today, the more people that join the Federation and support it, uh, there's safety in numbers for lobbying and protecting our resources. So it's really important to get new members. To be very honest, I liked it when there weren't as many women because all the men fussed over me all over the place on the stream. So, uh, no, but seriously, it's, it's terrific. I, the majority of my students now, I'd say 80% are women. Women are taking to the sport. It's the only part of the industry other than salt water that's still on a rise. Everything else is leveled out. And it's a graceful sport. It's not a, a muscular sport. It's timing, it's balance, it's, and, and the women really pick up on it, so they love it. They smell the roses a little bit more, I think, than some of you guys do. Uh, they look at the osprey flying over for 10 minutes instead of five. Uh, they look at the wildflowers, and, and so they're really, a, a, I think, a real plus in, in the future of fly fishing. It's a number of things. One is many of our members, uh, especially, as you say, somebody who's not terribly accomplished at this point, get an opportunity to learn more about fly fishing and the sport. I mean, we believe that, that the most conservative way to practice our sport is, is through uh, fly fishing and, and uh, catch and release. So part of it's the education of the fishermen, learning more in the camaraderie. Uh, we have a very strong conservation component which is carried on by some 250-odd clubs uh, all over the United States and Canada. So the, the total conservation effort of the Federation is, is the sum total of what all of them do. Um, and they're active in everything from stream restoration to uh, uh, lobbying uh, for regulations, testifying, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, everything that any active environmentalist does. So if you care about, you know, streams and are in the sport of, of fly fishing uh, or just about the natural environment, the Federation's a good place to uh, spend your time and efforts. The FFF has been instrumental in the formation of the casting certification program for instructors. Casting Board of Governors member Charles Jardine comments on the program. Well, you've got the standard module, you've got the entry level, you've got intermediate, then you've got that, that iniquitous thing called the masters, the thing that makes people shake in terror and worry about their whole foundation. Um, but it, what it is, it's a statement of fact. It's, it's a learning process of sorts. Just because you get a certificate to teach doesn't mean that you're a good teacher. That means you started the learning process. It's, it's, it really is. The more clients you have, the more you learn. You, you, I've been doing this for 20, 30 years, and quite frankly, I'm learning. Every time I have a student, every time I take them out, I learn another little bit I didn't know before. It's as simple as that. Now, having the sport codified in this way, having an, a process, means that when that person gets that award, ir irrespective of what it is, it gives them the confidence to go forward and teach. 
And somebody that's got the confidence to teach will be a better teacher. And I'm absolutely thrilled to see how it's grown. It's now an international thing. It's not just a national thing, this is an international movement that embraces Europe. It embraces, hopefully, England and, and Wales soon. It embraces all sorts of other areas, um, I believe, um, South Africa has got it, Argentina's got it, I think Japan's got it. So many people have got this wonderful philosophy, and it is a philosophy, but it gives people the confidence, and that's, that, you know, I think is vital. The new fly fisher team had the pleasure of traveling to Labrador with Joe Humphreys to do some fly fishing for big brook trout. Our destination in Labrador is Awesome Lake Lodge, which is located 85 miles from Goose Bay. The only way into this area is by float plane, which takes approximately one hour. Awesome Lake is in the Mealy Mountains and is blessed with an incredible view. The lake remains cold right through the summer thanks to a steady snow melt from the mountains. This means the fishing for brook trout is almost always good, with high temperatures rarely impacting the fish. Awesome Lake Lodge has been very popular with guests from the United States, Britain, and Canada. With a maximum of only eight guests, this fly fishing only lodge is a haven for fly fishers. The dry fly fishing is superb, though the brook trout can also be caught on streamers and nymphs depending on the conditions. Best of all, the accommodations are really comfortable with good fishing literally steps from your room. The brook trout average anywhere from 12 to 26 inches, with 16 inch specimens being common. There's an abundance of large fish in the four to seven pound range. Many are caught on mice patterns or streamers. On one evening, we were catching brook trout up to 24 inches on dry flies. The brook trout in Labrador are incredible because of their beauty and size. This is the last area in North America that truly supports huge brookies. Joe Humphreys is a renowned fly fisher from Pennsylvania. He has taught literally thousands of people how to fly fish and improve their skills. This includes celebrities such as President Jimmy Carter and actor Liam Neeson. Joe is probably best known for his skills with nymph fishing. We asked him to share some of his techniques for nymphing as he fished the outlet of Awesome Lake. One thing with this technique, with the trailer, I'm following as the flies are swinging, I'm following the swing with the rod tip, meaning that as the line swings, the rod tip stays right with the flies as, they, as they're making their, their turn in the current, as they're swinging with the current, the rod tip stays right with it. So I'm moving the rod tip with the swing and that keeps the flies down and I have good movement with them. And when a fish takes it like this one, Then, I'm right on top of them because I'm in touch with the fish from the whole way through. Okay. Just took the little, little fly. It's a beautiful little brook trout. They don't all have to be big, but it sure is pleasurable to catch them. Here's a little bead head white minnow off a dropper, and I put a, a heavy split shot above on the dropper. Then two more split shot, and then behind, I trailed a wet fly. Um, so this was a rig that uh, fooled that one fish. And uh, let's see if we can do it again. It's a good fish. Mm -hmm, nice fish. Mm -hmm. Head up. All right, we'll take him. Good job. A beautiful brook trout. We better let him go. And so what we're doing here, we're having a, we're taking a look. It's like nymphing. I let it settle. I had to get it down. Now I bounce it, lifting up and down. Hand and twist, keeping them in, working them deep. And so that's another, another way to work them. 
So there's more than one way to, to do this. And nymphing, you stop the rod high and you let those nymphs drop in first. Now we bounce them. Nice fish. Well, he's got, this is a good fish. Brook trout grow quickly on a smorgasbord of living organisms, everything from mayflies to salamanders. At its optimum water temperature of 55 degrees Fahrenheit, a brook trout will eat half its weight in minnows in one week. Play them off the reel. I thought he was heading for the rapids and the riffles, and I finally caught up with him. I don't know how big he is, but I'll say one thing, he's got plenty of energy. In spite of their name, brook trout are often found in lakes and are also common in cold, clear headwater streams. Like most salmonid fishes, brook trout thrive in waters with low temperatures and high oxygen content. Okay, we'll try to get his head up. Once his head up, we have him coming in, uh, almost. He's going around the boat, under the boat. Pull him back over here. Good heavens, fish. It can't be that bad. I got the head up. I had the head up. Side pressure, side pressure. Get the head up. Take him to the net. In the net, oh yeah. We'll take him. That's a beautiful fish. Cradling in the net. This is why we come to Labrador, to catch these big, beautiful brook trout. We hope you enjoyed today's show. To learn more about this episode or our series, then please join us on the internet at www.thenewflyfisher.com. Thanks for watching, tight lines, and we'll see you next week. The new Hi, I'm Tom Rosenbauer. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this and you want to see more, subscribe and you can get all our weekly uploads. Fly Fisher is made possible thanks to the Canadian Fly Fisher Magazine. Scientific Anglers, Mastering the Sport with Science. Islander Precision Reels.